All right. Well, we shall have a word of prayer this morning as we get started. Lord, thank you again for another day, another Sunday, another opportunity to be here. Lord, for Lord, not that we have to come, Lord, but that we get to come and be with other Christians today, and, and Lord, to be around uh, believers uh, of uh, like faith. Father, we thank you for these that have come this morning to sun, our Sunday school hour. And Lord, I pray it would be profitable. I pray, Lord, that you would open your word to us, help us to rightly divide it, help us to understand it, help us to get something from it. Oh, Lord, it is, uh, I believe the word would be uh, unfathomable. Lord, we simply cannot find the, the deepness of the riches of Christ. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes today. Lord, we thank you for the truth of thy word. We thank you, Lord, for, Lord, I believe we're seeing the Bible fulfilled before our eyes. Lord, I have no doubt about that. Lord, I, I know most people don't see it. They don't want to see it. But Lord, we thank you today that as we see the Bible being fulfilled, we are reminded of the many, many promises we are reminded of the many, many warnings that, Christ, you shall return. Lord Jesus, that you shall uh, come again. Lord, while we do not know the day nor the hour, we do not know that day nor the hour. Lord, we are sure that one day you shall return. Lord, unless we have totally misunderstood the Bible, Lord, on this point, Lord, it is obvious that one day you are going to return. And Lord, I, I pray, Lord, Lord, that we might be as, Lord Jesus, as you said in, there in, in your word, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Lord, as Paul said, help us to be watching. So, Lord, we thank you again for your word. Lord, that we're not discouraged. Are we downhearted? No, Lord, no reason to be downhearted. And Lord, we look forward, Lord, to thy return. If it's today, next week, next month, next year, five years, six years, Lord, seven years, Lord, whatever it may be. Lord, we, we anticipate thy return. But Lord, if you do not come, Lord, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, help us to be valiant, for the truth, Lord, in this hour. We pray again for your presence today. Oh, how we ask for your presence today. And oh, Lord, how we ask for your power today. Lord, the power of the Holy Ghost in our heart and lives. Lord, change us today. Lord, make us different today. Help us not to be the same as when we came in. Lord, if we pray for America. Lord, we're being torn apart at the seams. Father, we pray for America today. Lord, I ask again that you'll give us wisdom in our Sunday school hour. Father, I pray again that you'll guide and direct our thoughts this morning. And Lord, we'll thank and praise you for it in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. And amen. All right. Very good. Well, as we get started today, I'll say, I'll ask this. You know, does anybody have a question? I always like to ask that. Does anybody have a question about anything that you might have um, about the Bible? Anything? All right, go on once, twice. Let me just say this. I mentioned this when we were praying. Look at Matthew 24. We're going to jump to Revelation 12 in just a moment. But Matthew chapter 24, Matthew 24 Matthew 24, again, we are reminded that the disciples ask three questions. Jesus had said previously in 24 and verse 2, See ye not all these things, verily I say unto you, that there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And you'll note verse 1, Jesus went out, and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. I think 
I remember this, that the Temple Mount itself was like 43 acres. There were a lot of buildings. The temple itself was not what you would call huge. Uh, it was not very big. I forget the exact dimensions. I believe one was it was 75 feet high, but it was not what you would call very, very big as far as uh, an area that it would take up. But the Temple Mount was, uh, Solomon's porch was there. and Solomon's porch was quite long. Uh, there were a lot of gates that entered into the temple. You remember the lame man in chapter, what is it, chapter 3 of Acts. He laid by the gate beautiful and could not go in because people who had any infirmity whatsoever could not enter in uh, to the Temple Mount area. And so the disciples had showed Jesus all these buildings. And Jesus said then that there shall not be one stone left upon another. And when the Romans destroyed uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD, they destroyed, all that is left now is what we call the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall of the Temple Mount. But there have been some discoveries of late that would suggest that the temple was not exactly where See, a lot of people think that the temple is where the Dome of the Rock is, that Muslim mosque is, and that has to be removed. However, uh, some discoveries lately have suggested that maybe Solomon's temple was not exactly uh, where we, we thought it was in that area. It was in the area, of course, but not exactly where we thought. And so Jesus said, these stones, the temple's going to be destroyed, and it was. Verse 3, and he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? I believe referring back to when the temple would be destroyed. And again, I've said this, that those who take a, a uh, I believe the preterist view of, of history, believe that the book of Revelation was fulfilled in 70 A.D. Again, I have a hard time with that. There are just so many things in Revelation that would not seem to have been fulfilled in, in 70 A.D. So, but the disciples said, when shall these things be? They secondly ask, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? When you will come again. What will be the sign of thy coming? The second question, and of the end of the world. And so, in chapter 24, then, we would expect to find the answer to these three questions. Uh, Jesus answered and said unto them. And, and so he gives these, what I would consider to be signs concerning the end of the age and when he would come, I believe, in glory. Now, there are those who try to say that uh, the rapture is found in chapter 24. I, you know, I... And my good friend, our good friend, Dewey, uh, believes that to be true. I just, I find a hard time finding that in chapter 24. But I did want us to note this today, that it says in chapter 24, verse 6, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Well, there are wars going on. Uh, there are rumors of war uh, today. Um, you know, the, that... You know that guy over North Korea? The Ven I don't know if you heard the latest threat from Venezuela. You know, Venezuela used to be one of the richest countries in Central America. But what's happened there is what socialism does. It, 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 it destroys a nation. It has destroyed Venezuela. Uh, there's no food. People are rioting. They're rewriting the Constitution to give the guy that's there supreme power. But we hear of wars. We hear of rumors of wars. Um, that Jesus said, But he said, See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation. I believe that would be like the United States against North Korea. All right? Nations shall rise against nation. But then it says, and kingdom against kingdom. I believe that would refer to civil war within an own country. For example, in Syria, 
uh, they have a civil war. And hundreds of thousands of people have lost their lives in that civil war. It's really hard to tell who we're backing over there. Uh, if we're backing the rebels, the rebels are actually connected with ISIS, and we're against ISIS. But we say we're against Assad. Um, I, look, I was not for Hussein. I was not, I was not for Gaddafi. I was for neither one of those guys. They were absolute dictators. There's no doubt about it. But they did keep a semblance of order in their country. When they were removed, chaos ensued. Now, I'm not, look, there's no simple answer to that. But that idea of kingdom against kingdom, civil war, I just say this, that uh, we are, uh, America, I'm sure you've heard about the, really the tragedy in, in Charlottesville yesterday where three people were killed. You know, in America, we do have freedom of speech. I may not agree with what you say. And, and there are a lot of things I, you know, I think that some of our senators, someone asked me this. All right, I'm trying to complete a thought. I believe that some of our senators are probably demon-possessed. I, I really believe that. Someone asked me, do you think that people are demon-possessed today? And I believe that there are some people in Washington, D.C. that are probably possessed of demons. I, I just, I think that spiritual wickedness in high places. But I say that to say that America is being torn apart. Um, I hear people, I hear people say, well, and, and let me just say that we should, there should be a revolt. I'm not, I'm not even suggesting that. There are people who suggest that. But I will tell you that there are more of us than there are more of them. The national news media makes it out that everybody in America is against President Trump. But the truth is the majority of people in America are for President Trump. They just don't get it. They do not get it. They do not get it. And when the national news media sides with a communist dictator that is literally starving his people to death, he is starving their people to death. Uh, if, if you, you, your greatest thought is some black car driving up to your house and being taken away because you may, might think the wrong thing. When the national news media sides with somebody like that and says that our president, um, we are in, whether you agree with everything the president says, I don't. I do not. But we, we, are, we are literally being torn apart today. Um, and we have freedom of speech. Do I agree with Nazis? Of course not. Uh, but, and I don't want to go further. I just say that one of the things that Jesus said is kingdom against kingdom, civil war in countries, and, and we surely are seeing that. Nobody advocates civil war. In the last... I call it the war for Southern independence. In that war, 700,000 people lost their lives. Three quarters of a million people. I think I read this, that if you equated that to World War II, 43 million people would have lost their lives in combat in America, which would have been totally unacceptable. I'm just saying that nobody, nobody, nobody advocates a civil war. Nobody does that. But we are surely seeing America torn apart. All right. In Matt, Revelation chapter 12, we were there. Last time, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit in Revelation chapter 12. But in Revelation chapter 12, we see seven, beginning, we see seven personages, seven characters that are mentioned beginning in chapter 12. Now, we, we jumped to verse uh, 3 and 4 because we were talking about, talking about demons last time. And so we had jumped to 3 and 4, and we had missed the first one, found in 1 and 2. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. This is, is, I think, somewhat obvious uh, about Israel. 
that the first personage that we see is the woman, and that it refers there, it says there in that verse that it, a crown of 12 stars, and so we would take that to mean the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And so the first personage that we see uh, is Israel, is the woman, and, and then in verse 2, and being with child, cried travailing in birth. This would refer, of course, I believe, to the birth of Christ because the devil's going to destroy, try to destroy the woman. Look, if you would, at Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Someone said this to me, and maybe you're here and you said this to me, but I, I, and what they said to me was, was right. I believe it was John that said it to me, now that I think about it. Verse 1, now the Lord said un, unto Abram, this is before he changed his name to Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee, and I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee. Look, I think it was John said this, and, but whoever said it said this, I'd rather go down supporting the nation of Israel than go down not supporting the nation of Israel. God promised us that he would bless any person who would bless Israel. We have traditionally been a friend of Israel. Now, the last administration was not a friend of Israel, and some of the things that President Trump has done, uh, I'm not sure were in, in, in Israel's best interest. However, he is a friend of, of, uh, of uh, what do they call it, the president, the prime minister, uh, of Netanyahu of Israel, and the left-wing media, and Israel's trying to destroy him. Do you know what? You know what's, I'll tell you what's hypocritical. Here's what's hypocritical. The Democrats, and they're kind of backing off on it now because it's fi we're finding out the Democrats were actually in collusion with the Russians. So the Democrats are backing off a little bit about that. The Democrats are crying foul because they say the Russians try to interfere in our election. You are aware of the fact that President Obama sent a bunch of people to Israel to try and influence the last election in Israel to get Netanyahu defeated because Obama did not like him. And they have the, the audacity to stand up. I don't want to go down that road. But anyway, so it's like God promised a blessing to all the nations or anybody. You know, we support uh, that good man over there in Israel, and we support that project, Nehemiah, and we're trying to, you know, be a blessing to Jewish people over there. And, you know, we buy them bags of food or a warm blanket. And, and we're trying to do that. Look at Matthew 25. Now, I do not believe that Matthew 25 has a direct bearing upon us. But look at Matthew 25 for a moment. In the division of the nations, when it divides the sheep from the goats. Now, I think that this is a judgment that's a little bit later uh, on in our history. Uh, of the world. I do not believe that it applies directly to us. However, having said that, I believe that, that being a blessing to Israel, I'll, I'll go down supporting Israel. Do I agree with everything they do? Of course not. Their abortion rate in Israel is, is, is terrible. But then it's true in America. So, you know, I, it, and I don't condone either one. But in Matthew 25, it says this, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory. I think that this is probably referring to the time when Jesus comes to literally set up his kingdom here on this earth. <clears throat> Excuse me, that thousand-year reign that we've talked about in Revelation chapter 20, when he will rule and reign for a thousand years. Here's how I... I I believe the return of Christ is twofold. One, I believe he's going to return for the church, whether you believe he's going to return 
at the beginning of the tribulation, whether you believe at the middle of the tribulation, or whether, like some believe, at the end of the tribulation, we believe that Christ will come for his church one day. But when he comes for his church, he will not come back to the earth. Because First Thessalonians says that we'll be caught up together in the clouds to be of the Lord, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. All right, so he will come back to the earth. He will come back and get the church. But he will not come back to the earth. In Revelation 19, we read then that Christ will come riding upon a white horse. And we read from Zechariah 14 that he will touch down literally upon the Mount of Olives and there will be a great earthquake and the Mount of Olives will divide in half. Now, that's what 31 means. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. When Jesus literally comes back to set his kingdom up here on this earth. And the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Remember there, there's a promise. The Davidic covenant says that there is going to set a king upon the throne of David forever. And that would be the Lord Jesus. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king, I love it, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat, and I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him. That's important. The righteous. Now, I am convinced of this, that at the separating of the sheep and goats, at that judgment of the nations at the beginning of the millennium, that the righteous will be separated from the unrighteous. Uh, it says, <clears throat> uh, because it says in verse 44, then shall they also answer him saying, Lord. Now, that's a different group. It doesn't say anything about the righteous. It says the righteous here, all right? When, when did we see thee like this? Saw you a stranger, hungry, etc. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, verse 40, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And so I am convinced that God will bless them, I believe that God blesses America. I believe one of the reasons that God continues to bless America is because of our friendship with Israel and trying to support that tiny little nation. It is a tiny little nation. But I believe that God has promised to bless them, as it says in Revelation 12. Now I'll jump back to uh, uh, yeah, Revelation and Genesis chapter 12, where God promises to bless those that blessed. And so, do we agree with everything about Israel does? Of course not. But I have to tell you, they're our one true friend in the Middle East. They may be our only friend in the Middle East. But anyway, so, verse 2, And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. You know, Jesus was born of the tribe of Judah, out of the nation of Israel. That's where the Messiah came from. Now verse 3 and 4, okay, so that's the first person. Now remember we said there are 62 or 63 sevens in the book of Revelation. And here we see seven different characters, seven different personages in chapter 12 and also chapter 13. And so the first one was Israel. Uh, I remind you again that while the tribulation shall try all the nations of the world, that's obvious. In many respects, it is meant for Israel. Daniel 12, verse 1, says that there is going to come a time such as never was upon that nation, nor ever shall be. And I remind you about this, that probably, probably as we read the Bible, two-thirds of Israel 
the, the population of Israel, two-thirds, are going to be destroyed. It is going to be a horrific time for that tiny nation. Now, Brother Cliff Bennett said this to me once, and somebody else just said this to me. Somebody else said this to me uh, Friday. There is, there is one verse, maybe two verses in all the Bible. Because people question about the United States. There, there's not a lot that you can attribute to the United States and future things. You know, people say, well, what is going to happen in the United States? Well, one, we may be aligned with, with Western Europe. We may be. We might be. Uh, secondly, we may just become a, a third-rate, a third-world country. Leftists, really, that's what, they hate America. Folks, you need to understand that there are people in this country that literally hate America. They hate what we stand for. They believe that the founding of America was illegitimate, that it was founded by a bunch of white supremacists, neo-Nazis, if you would, that it was illegitimate in its founding, and they literally hate America and would love to see it, would love to see our Constitution destroyed. He said, well, why would anybody hate America so badly, preacher? That's hard to tell. But there are people who, in our country, I, I believe who, who hate, I, I don't believe it, I know it. You can tell by what they say, who hate our country. Now, let me just say this, if I might, that I believe that there are really a, a true liberal a true liberal is actually a conservative. But they've, they've hijacked liberalism, and, and now I, I think this, that there are probably some liberals who, though misguided, you know, have best intentions at heart. But they're, they're wrong. You know, they, they want to take all of our money and give it to people. That, that's, that's actually called being a thief, really. When you take it away from somebody that's got it to give it to somebody who doesn't have it just because you want to do that, that's really being a thief. That's, that's what it is. We have legitimized thievery in America. That's what we've done. But any, again, we don't want to go that way. But anyway, there are people that literally hate uh, America and would love to see us destroyed. So one, we may be aligned with Western Europe. We may be. And the Antichrist. We, we may be aligned with him. Yes, ma'am. A lot of people talk about Babylon in the book of Revelations. Yes. The U.S. represents that through the U.N. that's in New York City. And that's the reason why they focused on 9-11 hitting the Twin Towers, because that hits the financial system. And right. so we are in tied with the U.N. In, in Western Europe, too and part of the elites all control the banking system. So that's why they go after us. And, you know, her, her comment, Babylon is mentioned many times in the book of Revelation. Now, I know Brother Dewey believes that Babylon is literally going to be rebuilt over there in, in what we know as Iraq. And he's got some scripture for it. I, I'm going to say up front, I, I don't know the answer to the Babylon question. I, I don't know. But there are many people, because of Revelation, I believe it's chapter 18, when they, they stand afar off and Babylon the Great is destroyed in one day, and the merchants in their ships see the burning of Babylon, that there are, there are people, I'm not one of them, but I'm, I'm not saying they're wrong, you know, I, I, I'm just saying I don't know the answer to this one, that believe like London or New York City is Babylon, because it, they are both financial centers. And that very well, and, and you know, there are just so many things that we, we don't understand clearly, and 
I, you can read a lot of commentaries. A lot of commentaries tell you it's New York City that's Babylon. There are other people that say, no, it's London that's Babylon. See, the problem with chapter 18 of Revelation is if they see that from afar off, I don't really think that you can see a rebuilt Babylon uh, in a merchant ship. So while there are good people who think Babylon is going to be literally rebuilt, I'm not sure I'm one of them, but anyway. So, okay, so. What I'm saying, that's what's representing U.S. in the Bible. Right. And some people say that. And that could be. You know, we talk about the ten heads. There are people now who believe that those ten heads literally represent ten zones of the world. And that, and who, you know, it's just, I wish I could tell you. So, one, we are aligned with Western Europe. Two, we become a, 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 a second-rate, third-world country. Uh, a third thing is that America is destroyed. That there's not really much of America left. Now, what I think that tin horn guy You may not agree with this, I, you know, but I'm the preacher, so anyway. You can't appease a bully. You cannot appease a bully. All he does is take advantage of you. When Neville Chamberlain came back to London after meeting with Hitler, holding up that piece of paper, said, we have achieved peace in our time. Shortly after that, Hitler invaded Poland, Czechoslovakia, yeah, invaded that in 1939, and the world was plunged into World War II. Now, we didn't enter the world until, war until the end of 41, but the war had been going on three years before we ever entered the war, World War II. So, trying to appease a bully, you may know this, I, I know from personal experience, you can't appease a bully. Until you stand up to the guy, all he's going to do is try and take advantage of you. But the third possibility of America is that America has ceased to exist. However, however, there is either one verse or there are two verses that talks about the e eagle arising and helping Israel. And some have... have grab the hold of that to say that, well, the eagle represents America and that it may refer to America helping Israel. Maybe, possibly, I'm not, I, Brother Cliff believes that, somebody who talked to me the other day believed that, and that may be. Let's hope for the sake of our grandchildren, our children, that that's true that America does not cease to function, that we are aligned with Western Europe and we continue to be a country, and that we do help Israel. However, being reminded, I just want to say this, but we've got to move on, being reminded of the fact that the one world dictator that makes a peace treaty with Israel for seven years does come out of Western Europe. Uh, that is kind of obvious, and we'll talk more about him later. So. We're now looking at the second one, which is Satan. And there appeared in verse 3 another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And we know this, that... that Satan tried many different things to get rid of Jesus. He had Herod. You remember Herod had all the babies killed. But God warned Joseph and they fled, fled down into Egypt, fled out of Bethlehem, down into Egypt, and were there for a period of time until Herod died. But all the, all the babies, two years and younger, the slaughter of the innocents, it's called. 
How could a man be so despotic, so cruel so as to kill innocent? Because he was so afraid. With wise men said, we have come to worship him that is born king of the Jews. That Herod is so despotic, so hateful, so mean that he kills Satan, but, but Satan was behind that. The devil was behind that. I believe that in the, in, on the Sea of Galilee, those several storms that Jesus was in, you remember in Mark chapter 4, he's in the back of the ship asleep, and the wind and the waves are, are boisterous. And, and I, I, my opinion, I believe the devil trying to get rid of Jesus there. Um. I don't know the medical term for it. Maybe somebody does, but in the Garden of Eden, I mean the Garden of uh, Gethsemane, when Jesus sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Literally, he was in such anguish that the, uh, and, and so fervent in it that he was, the, 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 the capillaries were literally bursting and he was perspiring, as it were, great drops of blood. I know that God has a plan. And God's plans being worked out, I know that. I know God's plan is being worked out. But when Jesus was crucified on the cross, I know that that was God's eternal plan being worked out. I know that. Well aware of it. But I, I believe that, you know, Satan... I believe the devil, Lucifer, man, when he saw Jesus crucified on that cross, boy, that's great. And then he had those soldiers out there at the tomb trying to keep him from coming out of that grave. How ridiculous was that? But, you know, try to keep him from coming out of the grave. I believe that Satan tried everything. And so then when we read there in verse uh, 3 or 4, he, he, I believe, tried he would have tried anything and tried anything and everything. You remember in Matthew chapter 4, he took Jesus out. He was in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And afterward, after 40 days and 40 nights, the devil came to him and tempted him, turned these stones into bread. Uh, he took him up onto the pinnacle of the temple, which was, you know, uh, the, the temple itself was like 75 feet. And he said, Cast thyself off. And he said, the angels will catch you, catch you and bear you up. And then he took him up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. All the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Every kingdom of the world in a moment of time. He said, if, if you'll worship me, he said, I'll give you these. He said, well, how could the devil do that? Because he's the God of this world. That's why. Uh, and, of course, I, he was trying to get Jesus. Again do a, a, not necessarily a, a wrong thing. Jesus was hungry. He spent 40 days without food. Uh, to catch the, name, the angels to catch him. All the kings of the world. They're going to be his anyway, but the devil was trying to, trying to get him to take them before you know, it was time. I believe Satan at work. And Luke tells us this, that he left him for a season which means he must have come back four times to try to get him. And so we read there in that verse there that he stood before the woman and he, and he really, he literally tried, he tried uh, to get Jesus. Uh, he tried. He tried. Now, uh, verse 5. Here's our third one. And she brought forth a man-child. All right? So we know it's the nation of Israel. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up into God to his throne. All right, so we have this, this third personality, this third character that we read here. And as we look at this plan that God has worked out, the third one is the Messiah. We call him the Christ. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. That's why... Was Andrew said to Peter, we have found the Messiah, which by interpretation is the Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have found the Lord Jesus. We have found Lord Jesus, the Messiah. We have found him. The men in John chapter 4, 
Look at John 4 for a moment. John chapter 4, real quickly. We won't take a lot of time on the Messiah, but John chapter 4, we read this. The woman uh, had gone out to, and she had met Jesus at the well. You'll remember that account. Met Jesus at the well, and we don't know all that transpired. We know what John wrote down. Because she went running back into town and told the men of that village, said, come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. Come see a man that, come see this man that told me all things that ever I did. And so they went out. Now, in verse 42, uh, verse 41, and many more believed because of his own word, Jesus' word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him, for our, we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Verse 50 says, uh, Is that the verse that I want? No, that's not the verse I want. But anyway, verse 42 was one of the verses I wanted. We know that he is the Christ, the Savior of the world. So our third personality in chapter 12 is the Christ. It is obvious that is who it is, that it is the Christ. And she brought forth and notice who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up. Number one, he's going to rule. Read it again. Who was to rule. Who was to rule. He has not done that yet. The, uh, uh, the, the amillennialists believe that Jesus is ruling from heaven today. They, they believe that. I don't know how they get that, but they believe that. They, and I, I've said this to you before. My, my, and I don't know about my other brother, but I know that my one brother told me you know, that he believes the world is getting better. I, I honestly don't know how he says that with a straight, with a straight face, but... He said, I believe the world is getting better. And he believed that, and he said, I believe that in my son's lifetime, my nephew Billy, he said, I believe that in my son's lifetime, I believe that the kingdom of God is going to come forth on this earth. I don't know how anybody. He said to me, I know why you're discouraged, because you believe things are getting worse. Well, yeah. I'm not really discouraged about that, but yeah, I, I believe things are getting worse. Now, Jesus is going to rule and reign one day. Now, but it says in that verse that it was called up to God, unto God, and to his throne. Now, Jesus has gone to heaven. That's where he is. He's seated at the right hand of God, where he makes intercession for us. Because we're going to see what what's going on here in just a minute. But where Jesus is, and he makes intercession for us, Really, day and night, we are, we are so prone to failure. Brother, I need an intercessor. Amen. I need somebody to intercede for me. At the, as the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, I believe it's verse 16, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. I need somebody interceding for me at the throne of grace. And that's the Lord Jesus who washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, in verse 5, her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. That's where he is. Jesus is there. And the woman fled into the wilderness. Where she had the place prepared of God, where that place is, we uh, believe it to be, uh, I know where it is. I know what it is. What's that place in the wilderness that God has prepared for Israel? Somebody knows. What is it? Nobody knows. I know what it is. I'll think of it in a minute. Petra? Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Petra. I believe that, that, that God has prepared that place for I believe that God... You remember how when the Israelites left Egypt and here comes Pharaoh and he's chasing the people and God put a cloud between Pharaoh and Israel so that Pharaoh really could not see what was going on in the camp. I believe that God's going to, 
that the people, I believe a third of Israel, two-thirds, I believe, will be destroyed. A third of Israel is going to go into the wilderness where they will be protected by, I believe, that cloud of God so that, you say, well, why wouldn't the Antichrist just go over there and bomb them where they're at? Why wouldn't he shoot missiles in there? Because just as God divinely protected Israel in the day of, of leaving Egypt, I believe that God is going to divinely protect them again. You say, can God do that? Well, of course he can do that. What kind of question is that? Of course he can do that. And so they will be protected. Now notice, a woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days, or about three and a half years. You'll remember this, that the tribulation period is a period marked by, uh, of a seven-year period that begins when the Antichrist signs a treaty with Israel. All right? So it, there's going to be trouble, but there's going to be a peace treaty. But in the midst of that, in the middle of that seven year, he will break that peace treaty with Israel. He will set himself up in the temple to be God, to be worshipped as God. Uh, Daniel, Daniel calls it the abomination of desolation. Be set up there and, and Israel come under great persecution and she will flee into the wilderness. Uh, the Bible says beware when they say peace and safety for sudden destruction come upon you and so uh, the last three and a half years that I believe God is going to divinely protect Israel. The Bible says that the church is the bride of Christ. The Bible says that Israel is the apple of God's eye. It literally says that, that Israel is the apple of God's eye. It also says this, that Israel is the wife of God. Now, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how all that, you know, plays out other than the Bible says that Israel is the wife of God and that God will divinely protect her. Fellows, surely fellows, surely fellows. But Joe, when you say uh, peace and destruction, you're talking just about Israel. Look, if you would, I believe that's in 1 Thessalonians. I could be wrong about that, and I might not know where that is. Uh, 1 Thessalonians. Um. Uh, I thought it was, uh, yeah, it is chapter 5. Now, the church of Thessalonica was a pretty good church. Paul said in verse 18 of chapter 4, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Well, what words? Well, the words that one day the dead in Christ will rise, and then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together in the clouds. We shall not all sleep. Not everybody's going to die. Not everybody's going to die. Not everybody will. If Jesus tarries, we shall die. If he doesn't tarry, we shall be caught up. I mean, that's just... I, I don't think I've ever really, really... I think I'm going to ask my brother this. It's probably going to result in a big argument. But I'm going to ask him about these verses. How do, you, how do you explain Revelation? How do you explain 1 Thessalonians that we are going to be caught up in the clouds and the dead are going to be caught up too? Now look, unless you don't take that literally, if you don't take it literally, then you can make it mean whatever you want. But if we take it literally, then we must believe that not everybody is going to die. So then in chapter 5, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. 
therefore let us leave. When it says in verse 3, for they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. I'm, I'm, here's what I believe that that's referring to, Connie, because it says there in that verse, uh, uh, in verse 2, uh, the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, that day of general judgment upon the earth. Of general judgment upon the earth. Because you'll, remember, you'll be reminded of this. Well, there are a couple things about the days of Noah. One, the earth was corrupt. The earth was corrupt. I'll tell you, if some of those politicians got what they deserved, if some of those politicians got what you and I would get if we did what they did, that is corrupt. That is corruption at the highest level. Hey, but wait a minute. Jesus said it will be like that. And the earth is filled with violence. The earth is filled with violence. Surely we see that. But that's nothing compared to what's going to happen. And so, so when we think about the days of Noah, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage, they were eating, they were drinking. Brother, brother, life goes on. You say about those, well, life goes on, and it does. But the day of the Lord when we're talking about the coming of the Lord, and that's what Paul is speaking about here, it says, By the time season, brothers, I, you have no need that I write unto you. For ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. It's going to kind of sneak up on people. For when they shall say peace and safety. Oh, we don't have anything to worry about. There's nothing to worry about. When people say there's nothing to worry about, then it's time to worry. So, ah, there's nothing to worry about. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, us, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. I've said... I've said several times, I believe the Bible is being literally fulfilled before our eyes. And we understand that. We see that. We get that. Yeah, that's okay. We understand and get that. Why is it that you and I can see that being friends with Israel is in America's best interest? Why, why can we see that, but there are, pardon me, nut jobs in Washington that I believe, are vested in the destruction of Israel. Why is it that, you know, we talk about the mark of the beast. We, we talk about that, and uh, some company now is offering to put a chip in, in the hand of their employees so that you can get in to work, so that you can scan stuff, so that you can use the vending machines. You know, they, they're putting this chip in. Why is it that we can see the Bible being fulfilled right before our eyes? But the world doesn't. Well, that's because, as Paul says, verse 4, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness. We get it. We understand it. We know that there, there, you know, people used to walk around with these signs on the front, the back, walk down the street, eat at Joe's or whatever. But, you know, people used to walk around, the end is near. Repent and believe. Well, I don't know when the end is, and neither do you. But we believe. Here's what Jesus said. So we'll take it at his word. No man knoweth the day nor the hour. But he said, you will know when it's near, even at the door. He said, you'll know when it's near. Now, I don't know when it is, but he said, you'll know when it's near. That's why he says there in verse 4, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you. As a thief, ye are the children of light and the children of the day, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch. Let us watch. Be sober. So that sudden destruction, I believe, is a general, a general thing. 
uh, that, man, it's, it's going to happen. Look, I, I, I will say this. I'm going to say this. I don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. None of us know what's going to happen. Those nut jobs, there are, there are people that hate Christians in America. There are people. Look, yesterday they were protesting. Now, I am not a Nazi. I am not. But they were protesting the removal of General Lee's statue from the, from the University of Virginia. Now, I'm going to tell you that General Lee was one of the finest Christian men that you would ever meet. That's what he was. General Lee was one of the finest Christian men that you would ever meet. I'm, I'm just going to tell you this. You don't have to believe me, but I'm telling you this. The war for Southern independence was not over slavery. I know that's what they teach in school. But here's what President Lincoln said. Somebody said, we just should let them go. Let, Lincoln said, let them go. Let them go. The federal government will be bankrupt if we let them go. Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia gave three quarters of the money in taxes to run the federal government in 1859. Three quarters of the money to run the federal government. I'll just say this. You got me on this. I'm going to say it. In 1859, cotton exports from the South were $161 million. That's what cotton exports, cotton exports were in 1859. In 1859, northern exports total came to 89 million. The South far, uh, and there was a 40% tariff on all imported goods. The South immediately dropped to 10%, and the North said, we can't afford it. Do you know who the biggest slave traders were in 1862? The biggest slave traders in 1862 were found in New York City and Boston. How come Lincoln didn't go and shut them down? Why did he do that? I'm just telling you that the myth about slavery, I, I, don't, I can't get into it. I don't even know how we got on it. Who brought that up? But anyway, I'm just saying that general, general destruction is I believe what it's talking about, but we are not unaware of it. We see what's happening. Uh, uh, we see what's happening, and we say, boy, the end must be near. The end must be near. We believe the end is near. Again, nobody knows when it is, but I, here's what I want to say, and then we've got to be through. Because I don't know when the end is near, and because I don't know what is going to happen, you ought to be wise, brethren. You ought to be wise. You ought to be wise. You hear all, they're trying to go to a cashless society. I'm just telling you that you ought to be wise in, in your preparation. You're not one of them preppers, are you? Well, I think you ought to be wise. I think you ought to have some food. I think you ought to have some money on hand. I think you better be prepared for what may or may not happen. I'm not saying it is going to happen. But what we thought would never happen, oh, they'll never take the Bible out of school, preacher. Oh, they'll never take prayer out of school, preacher. They'll never do anything. Well, now, 50 years later, look at us. I'm, I'm serious when I say We are literally tearing ourselves apart. God have mercy on us. I mean that. God have mercy on us. All right, so we see three. Next time we'll look at the fourth thing uh, in Revelation chapter 12. We see number one, Israel. We see number two, uh, the devil. We see number three, the Christ. Number four, we'll see the archangel. All right, we'll do that. Anybody got anything they want to? Anything? All right, Lord, we thank you again. Lord, for another opportunity to open your word. And Lord, I sure don't know when the end is. But Lord, you said we'll know it when it's near, even at the door. And so, Lord, we thank you for, Lord, giving us some spiritual perception. Lord, we can look at the Bible and we can say, how come everybody else doesn't see that? 
because we're not in darkness. But we are children of the light. Therefore, let us not sleep, but let us be, let us be sober and watch. To the end, maybe sooner than we think. Lord, you've commanded us to be wise. And Lord, we need to be wise. Father, I pray, Lord, help us, help us, help us, dear God. I can't help but think again of what Jesus, you said in Mark 13. What I say unto you as he's referring to the disciples, I say unto all, watch. Dear God, Father, give us spiritual eyes to be watching what is happening, Lord, in our world. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.